come here by the grace of God. Sometimes you feel guilty because you are a survivor. You hate to call it an anniversary because sometimes it's an anniversary none of us want to think about. It's the most powerful windstorm on the face of the planet. Located at the top of the Enhanced Vegeta Scale, the EF5, formerly known as the F5, is the highest classification that a tornado can be rated. With winds in excess of 200 miles per hour, the EF5 tornado is capable of unfathomable destruction, including scouring of pavement from roads, debarking trees, tossing locomotives, and crushing automobiles like cans. Unfortunately, they are also capable of leveling well-built homes, schools, businesses, and sometimes entire towns all the way to the ground. Fortunately, they are as rare as they are destructive, with an average occurrence of less than one EF5 tornado per year across the entire United States. They are so rare, in fact, even though the U.S. averages nearly 1,300 twisters per year, sometimes many years or even a decade will go by without a single tornado reaching EF5 status. We are currently in one such lull, with the last EF5 being recorded in Moore, Oklahoma on May 20th, 2013, nearly a dozen years ago now. That storm dealt a devastating blow to the South Oklahoma City suburb, killing two dozen people and hurting more than 300 others. The storm destroyed almost 1,200 homes while inflicting two billion in damages. More recently, a storm not quite reaching Cat 5 status, the Mayfield, Kentucky EF4, was in the media spotlight for several weeks following its December 2021 rampage through parts of three states. The rare late-season violent tornado was on the ground for nearly three hours while traveling 165 miles across parts of northwest Arkansas, western Tennessee, and through western Kentucky, where it flattened the town of Mayfield at peak EF4 intensity, with winds estimated at 190 miles per hour. The nighttime storm killed 50 57 people while injuring 500 more. Mercifully, the conditions required for violent tornadoes, which are tornadoes rated at either EF4 or 5, do not come together very often. The ingredients to have the most violent tornadoes, those ingredients don't get together very often. You have to have warm, moist air from the Gulf, and you want it not just warm and moist, but very warm and moist and that doesn't happen all the time. Then you want a very strong storm system, a uh, very strong jet stream, very strong flow in the middle part of the atmosphere. That doesn't happen all the time. And those things have to come together. They have to be in the same place. Usually when these ingredients do come together, it's over a small area and can result in a regional outbreak. This occurred during the June 2nd, 1990 outbreak, the Super Tuesday outbreak of February 5, 2008, and also the outbreak of March 2nd, 2012. Each of these systems produced dozens of tornado touchdowns over a handful of states and featured a few violent tornadoes such as the Long Track EF4 that ripped through Henryville, Indiana, taking 11 lives in 2012. While these would be considered regional outbreaks, on very rare occasions, conditions come together for something on a much larger scale, hence the name Super Outbreak, such as the one that occurred in April of 2011. The Dixie Alley outbreak resulted in a record 216 tornadoes that ambushed parts of the southern and eastern U.S. on April 27, 2011, resulting in more than 300 fatalities. The mega outbreak produced an impressive 11 EF4s and an astonishing four EF-5s over parts of the Deep South that included the Hackleburg, Alabama and the Smithfield, Mississippi EF-5s, which killed nearly 100 people. On the same day, both Tuscaloosa and Birmingham were also hit by a killer EF-4, resulting in another 64 deaths. The combined total of 15 violent tornadoes in a single day is the most in recent decades and third most ever observed behind the Palm Sunday outbreak of 1965, which produced 17 of them. And then you have what occurred on April 3rd of 1974. And then of course you have the big one, the super outbreak of 1974. It changed everything profoundly in weather. At a time when there was no Doppler radar, no modern satellites and no advanced weather modeling, forecasters were about to get their wake up call. Well, the weather forecasting, as you say, was pretty crude back then, but uh, there was uh, some numerical weather forecasting, very, very crude, and it was predict predicting that weather conditions that sort of we knew on the large scale were favorable for severe weather tornado outbreaks were going to come to fruition on April 3rd. And the Severe Storm Center put out the word that in our area here, 
that we uh, was going to have <laughs> some interesting weather. Meteorologist Don Burgess was working for NOAA's National Severe Storms Laboratory in Norman, Oklahoma at the time. The April 3rd outbreak was so different in that it had this large area of the country uh, kind of from the Mississippi River east where it was open with big low pressure center way to the north huge warm sector, very warm, unusually warm, unusually moist, and an extremely strong jet stream coming over and a widespread area involved. And, and that is very, very unusual, uh, extremely rare circumstances coming together. And so the Storm Prediction Center and the National Weather Service sent out a message to all their offices that, hey, if you get a chance take your radars down tomorrow, April 2nd. And uh, because we think it's going to be a bad day on April 3rd, you're going to need those radars to be operating at peak efficiency. They were looking ahead 24 hours that everything was stacking up in the atmosphere, that thunderstorms, tornadoes were possible, etc. And we all know what happened on that Wednesday. It was a classic severe weather setup with powerful upper level winds rotating out of the southern Rockies and a strong low pressure system forming across the central plains that flooded much of the eastern U.S. with unseasonably warm and humid air at the surface. In addition, however, there was something very unusual. Dry air was being pulled into the system from the desert southwest, forming an abnormally strong dew point gradient in the mid-levels, essentially creating a ticking time bomb for the eastern U.S. John Gordon from the National Weather Service in Louisville puts it this way. So what happened is the dry line moved east. The dry line you here in Oklahoma and Nebraska and Kansas actually went east. So you have a strong dew point gradient. A lot of surface heating got really warm that day. And you had what's called a couple jet streams. In other words, you get double your forcing, not just one, you get two. So everything just exploded massively. Prior to April 3rd of 1974, there had never been more than two EF5 tornadoes in a single day. On that day, however, there were seven. As history would later reveal, two of those EF5 monsters would touch down only minutes apart and just a few miles from this location where I'm standing along the banks of the Ohio River. In fact, one of them would cross the river right here in downtown Brandenburg. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, our story begins across the river in the parts of southern Indiana. I remember that as being a very humid and extremely warm day for April. It was about 84 degrees. That, that day was warm, uh, much like today, but not quite as breezy. Residents of southern Indiana had no idea of the danger that was building around them. Von Marshall was the principal at Morgan Elementary in Harrison County at the time. We had no expectation of anything happening that day other than just a normal procedure. We were aware that it was hot and steamy. We absolutely no idea that we would have a tornado. And my mother and I were sitting on the front, we just went out and sat on the front porch. And as we were sitting on the front porch, things, it began to hail. Um, then after the hail stopped, it got real quiet. We, um, we, we looked out over the wood line, kind of over this way, and you could see it got, it was very, very dark. My father, my brother and I had been to Corden to pick up some fencing for the horses. And, uh, we were on our way back when we noticed this huge black cloud following in the west. So we kept an eye on it and you could see, we thought were birds up there circling around. So we say, got my father, uh, he looked at it and said, um, you know, we probably need to leave. Uh, we were living in a new double wide mobile home because we hadn't built our home yet. And so it was not a good place to be with high wind. We was getting ready to go to work and looked out the front door at this black cloud and it was, it was huge. It was hanging right over our property, but everything was really still. It was really still, and this cloud was so low, you felt like you could touch it. Things got kind of dark, and in the, over in the west, I saw a lot of 
cloud movement. And I thought, well, we should get in the hallway. Meanwhile, a short distance to the south, Brandenburg residents were going about their normal routines. I didn't know anything was gonna happen about the weather. I owned a clothing store downtown. It was called the Cedar Chest. And I went to work at 10 o'clock, had the babysitter there at the house. Mary Clark took care of our boys, Anthony and Kale. And uh, it was warm for that time of year, extra mm -hmm. warm. So the store got hot, so I had the door propped open to let some air in. We went to school that day, and the weather was just off feeling. And my brother and I went to the St. John's School. We, we took pictures outside that day, and um, the wind was blowing, and the, the sky looked funny. I got off the school bus and walked up to the neighbor's house. My mom was there and they were kind of chatting about the weather that day. Um, and my next door neighbor said, if it gets bad, come over. We didn't have a basement, they did. When we got out of school, my mom, we were car riders. So my mom brought us home and um, she said, I think you all need to stay in today because we, we always went outside. It got warmer as the day went on. And then sometime in the afternoon, 3.30 or maybe a little bit later than that, we knew a storm was coming. I didn't know what a tornado really meant, to be honest. I mean, 18 years old, I didn't care about the weather. Brandenburg Mayor David Pace was in high school when the storm hit. Uh, I happened to be a volunteer firefighter at uh, for Meade County, and we just happened to stop at the firehouse. and. We were there and the city superintendent stopped by and told us that there was a tornado they were tracking, but it looked like it was going to go around the western side of Brandenburg. So we didn't think much about it and just kind of hung out in the firehouse, just waiting to see what was going to happen if we had to do anything. And The state trooper had run out of the house and he came by and he saw me standing in that door and he called. He said, you need to take cover. There's a tornado touched down in Irvington that's headed this way. A few miles to the north, faculty at Morgan Elementary in Harrison County, Indiana, was swiftly ushering kids to safety upon the sighting of a tornado by the school's principal. And he told us to get to our safety spot that there had been sighted a tornado nearby and do it now. Scott Trowbridge was a third grader at the elementary school when the storm arrived. At that age, I just kind of have images but I do remember sitting in the classroom and Mr. Marshall sticking his head in the, in the back door and I heard him say tornado. I just remember getting out and getting into the hallway and crouching down and putting a book over our head, um, but have, not having any idea there was anything real serious going on at that time, at least at that moment. And we tried not to frighten the children. We just told them that there was a tornado nearby, but that's all we knew, but we were going to go out in the hall with our big math book and get in our position, which the children did. You first hear the wind, and as the wind gets stronger, you begin to tell the children, this is the wind coming. You'll be safe under your book you were constantly encouraging the kids, but at the same time, you didn't want to be dishonest with them. The kids were kind of joking around, you know, because during tornado drills, that's what we do at that age. Um, but I remember, I remember hearing the wind, and I'll never forget that, that whoosh, you know, and then it got louder and louder, and people say it like a, like a train, and it was. And then I knew something was, you know, you knew something was going on. I had no idea how close this monster tornado was to us. Um, and, but I remember the wind, the doors opening and looking down the hallway, glancing down and there was one of the staff members that had long hair looking and seeing her go from one side of the hallway to the next and her hair blowing. I have that, still have that image in my head. Um, and it was loud. I mean, it was, we knew it wasn't a drill at that point. It sounded like a train. There's no two ways about it. It sounds like a train. It is very loud. I can remember Judy Becker 
telling me, hollering at me and telling me there went the roofs. I know that there was a lot of debris out our windows uh, as the desks were blown out of our windows. And I also lost my roof and it landed on my station wagon. Meanwhile, a couple of miles up the road in Palmara, the Armstrong family decided to leave their mobile homes and make a run for it as the storm approached. We loaded up um, myself, my mother, our dog, uh, my father, and my sister and her, her child. And we headed down the driveway and we got to the ditch at the end of the driveway and thought about getting into that because it was full, of, but it, however, it was full of water. So we could not do that. When we got to the highway and looked across the highway, that's when we seen things in the air circling. We thought it was birds, like buzzards. We wasn't sure what we was looking at. Uh, come to find out that we were looking right into the face of an F5 to tornado. When we got up to 150, we could see that what we thought were birds circling wasn't, it was debris and it was uh, building debris, it was uh, plywood, all kinds of stuff just twirling. But we didn't, still hadn't thought it had touched down because you could not see a funnel. Um, and so it was another weird thing that once we got on the road and started heading toward Greenville, you could look off and see the rotation and you could see little funnels coming out of it. Uh, but they would come down and they would go back up. They'd come down, go back up, and it would happen many times in different spots. As is the case with most violent tornadoes, many tornadoes that day developed a multi-vortex structure. This coupled with the fact that both the Brandenburg and Southern Indiana storms lacked a visible condensation funnel at times, obscured their identities as F5 monsters. The Indiana storm would grow to over a mile wide as it reached Palmyra. And about that time, my sister was screaming. They said that the, um, uh, there was debris going across the road behind us. What we know now, it was concrete blocks from a, a building being destroyed. But we didn't know it that at the time. We still hadn't thought it touched down. We were so close to it at that time. It was so wide, you couldn't see the edges of it. So we didn't realize it was a funnel. But when we got to the highway, my dad turned towards the east and we drove we started driving, but the wind had started coming across the highway as we were turning onto it, and it grabbed a hold of the back of the car, and the car was going like this. My father was trying to look at it and trying to drive, and we're saying, just drive, and, and you could tell he was having problems keeping the car on the road. It was starting to get really, really windy. So it was shaking the back of the car, and we, we were in the back seat, my brother and I, and we were screaming, Dad, you're going to have to go faster. It's catching us. We've got to go faster. He says, I've got it all the way to the floor. It's all it's going to do. So we kept driving and driving. We drove, uh, and then it, about a half a mile down the road, uh, the tornado came across. And we could see the wind, but that's all we could see was just wind coming across that highway. But as we got closer to the home, to where our road is, you could see trees broken off, a trailer flipped over. Um, other things started, more trees, uh, more damage. Then we noticed as we got close to our home and our lane that everything was gone. There was five houses on the highway that had been swept clean. There was nothing left, not even a stick was left on those houses, just the concrete slab that they had been built on. Okay, so we parked and I ran across the field here and our home, which was sitting right here, basically, was ended up being three to 400 feet down in that field where it hit with an impact at a corner of it and dug a huge hole in, this, in the property there or in the field and it was just destroyed. My sister's was over on this way and it looked like it had exploded. I mean, it just, it was all twisted and mangled and thrown up against those trees back there. Yeah, it was shock. I mean, when you learned, you, you expected to see your house, you know, but when there was nothing but 
a bunch of metal laying in the field. It was just such a shock. As residents in southern Indiana were being pummeled by a mile-wide EF-5, Brandenburg was about to take a direct hit by one of the most intense tornadoes ever observed. Amanda Brown was working in her shop in downtown on Main Street when the phone rang. And Tony called and said, you need to take shelter. There's a tornado coming. Well, I didn't even know what a tornado was going to be. And I remember the wind picked up, so I tried to shut the door to the shop to keep the wind from blowing in. And the wind was so strong, I couldn't shut the door. And I remember right before all that, it got so quiet outside. There wasn't a bird chirping, there was nothing. You know, no one thought that it would be a tornado like that. We didn't know what a tornado was, you know, how devastated it can be. I was a bivocational Baptist minister. I was the pastor at Cold Spring Baptist Church in Battletown and worked for the Meade County Messenger. My job, part of my job, was to deliver papers throughout the county to the various newsstands and grocery stores. And, and uh, so I had made several stops and got back to the Messenger and took the large canvas bags of newspapers to the post office so they could be mailed. And I went to the, the dock there at the post office and uh, talked to Mr. Owen Dugan, Mr. Dick Muth, and explain to them, fellas, when this sky is this color, there's a tornado close. We should take cover. Sally Evans was a first grader at the time. Um, my mom turned on Presto, the clown. That was the show of choice, I guess, for me. And I had a brother that was a year and a half old. And uh, mom had never gone back to work after he was born. Um, and probably about, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes later, um, my mom ran in the room where I was and grabbed me by the arm and had my brother in the other arm and ran over to the next door neighbor's house. And I remember being outside and I remember looking back and seeing black. I don't know what we were doing, but my brother, we have this big picture window and he looked out and said, what's that? What is that, mama? And she said, oh my God, get to the basement. It's a tornado. And it, we were dead track in the track of it. And actually, once we got outside, she went to the front and I jerked away to go to the back. And I know she said that was the most scared she thinks she'd ever been in her life because at that time you could see it. It was just black. I mean, even as a little kid, I remember it was just black. I've had people ask if I could see light on either side and, and I don't remember that. It was just a big wall of black. So we had to go down some stairs, out the back door, down some stairs to get in the basement. And we all got down there. Um, I remember we crouched down, Johnny and I, and, but I don't remember the sound of it. I kind of like biked out or something. Amanda's husband, Tony Brown, was working at the local Chevrolet dealership in Brandenburg when the storm hit the town. We hadn't heard sirens going off but didn't expect anything and then a car pulls in and he was a GMAC representative that had been here in town waiting for a guy and he came in and the windows were all out of his car and he couldn't even hardly talk he said your town is gone and I said what are you talking about he said your town is gone we chatted just for a minute or two and I as they said, as I drove away from the dock at the post office, it blew the windows out of the front of the post office. So I left the post office, which it was the old post office, and uh, turned to go back downtown. The messenger was downtown uh, then at that time. And as I turned the corner to go downtown, a large sign, it looked like the RECC sign, went over the road in front of me. The ferocious storm had caught up with him just as he was making it back to Main Street. So I turned uh, there at the uh, Moose Lodge and went in behind the Moose Lodge to a kind of a, a little block wall and uh, where we parked the pickup truck and thought I better see what I can do. So I started to get out of the truck and looked up and saw trees, gable ends of houses, debris in the air. and. Uh, stuff was already starting to, to move. So I thought, well, best thing for me to do is stay in the truck. So I 
laid down in the seat and got under the dash as much as I could. It picked the truck up and moved it a little. And uh, at one point I looked up and saw the, the bottom end of the one of the doors at the county garage coming right toward the windshield. So I, wow. yeah, it didn't take long to put my head back down. Or so we could hear stuff starting to hit the building and we started hearing people upstairs of the city hall so we were able to help them get from upstairs to the basement and i guess that kind of kept us busy is the first part and then it got so loud and dust falling through the floors and then uh, just the windows you could hear everything breaking and then total silence for it seemed like forever but we were in the eye, we assumed that's what it was. I remember the sound, it was just, but like they say, the train. You hear that roaring, and then I could hear the glass, and I could, I thought I could hear things turning over in the shops, but I could hear the glass, and then the wind was just horrendous. We just waited, and then the back part of the storm really was what tore everything up but to us. It was the backlash that tore that house, twisted it completely, two-story house, spun it completely on the foundation and just dropped most of it in the back corners. And you know, luckily where the doorway we were going to get out is, uh, was was saved where we could get out. And when we walked out, it just wasn't anything. When we went in, all the buildings were four foot tall and you know, people were injured and Luckily, thank goodness, the electricity was knocked out or there'd probably been more people because all the wires and stuff, you were just walking on everything. You didn't know what to do. Everybody was in shock and there were people with no clothes on. At the time, Melissa Pipes was a third grader living in the West Hills section of Brandenburg, the area hardest hit by the colossal storm. So as soon as it was over, all you could see was the sky. And uh, Johnny and I had scratches and bruises on us, and I, I, I can hear my mom yelling, Missy, Johnny, you know. And um, we looked around, and, there, uh, and I didn't even see my grandmother. She barely made it through the basement door, and she got a broken hip and had a stroke. She was 74 years old. There was a mattress on top of my mom, and she was laying on top of my nephew. He was 22 months old at the time. So we got the mattress off of her and she had a concrete block on her head and her head was bleeding. And I remember my little nephew was crying and she was, you know, we were, it, it, we were, it was just a big confusion mess. And there were people walking around lost and I remember this lady, Kelly Dow, asking me where her teeth were. Yes, I remember that just plain as day. Johnny and I got my, my mom up and uh, by that time, people were walking around and um, serving, you know, just looking at all the destruction and Johnny and I were like, standing there just in a daze, didn't know what to do. And I had long blonde hair and I had uh, insulation in it. And just, I can remember it just, and it was, it rained, we were wet, we were scared. Meanwhile, survivors began emerging from the wreckage downtown. You know, when something like that happens, um, you kind of go into a time warp. It's like every second seems like an eternity. And, when it finished, when it stopped, uh, I got out of the truck and tripped over concrete blocks. They were scattered all over the area. Twigs had made holes in the, the metal topper on the back of the truck, right behind the cab. There was bricks and stuff all over the, the vehicles out there and the whole front of our shops was destroyed. I said, take me to town. And we got to where Big O is right now. And you look across and there's nothing with the Baptist Church and all that is nothing. I got out of the car, ran down the hill, went behind the old library and down where she was. When I got to downtown Brandenburg, <clears throat> it was like bombs had gone off. It made brick out the road and piled up and the, all the buildings. Every place that I grew up in was gone. You, you couldn't tell what street you were on. You couldn't get your bearings. You couldn't figure out where you were or whose house you were next to. It was that horrific um, and complete.
just complete devastation. And I, this is where I was raised, right here where the courthouse is, and I knew all those people, you know, and uh, it was gone. I mean, those little houses were just concrete slabs, and that's all was left was slab. Immediately, Tom and Tony sprang into action and started rescue operations for those who were trapped in the rubble on Main Street. And we walked down to Rose Grinnell's store. Rose Grinnell had a, she was in her 80s, had a two-story dry goods store. She lived in the upstairs. And it was just a quaint, wonderful, we call it vintage clothing, but it was just a great place to go. And um, anyway, went in there, uh, well, we had to tunnel. Uh, Ackley was smaller than me, so he would hand me boards and material and we just built a tunnel and found her. She, we could hear her crying and screaming and we got under there and found her. She was trapped, not hurt badly, but we had to then get her to crawl um, out. Wow. And uh, so it was, it, it, the more she crawled, the more upset she became. And so it was difficult to get her out. We did get her out and um, Four men came by with a sheet of plywood and laid her on the plywood and carried her up to the clinic to be examined. And one of those men I remember was Mr. Tony Brown. So we started looking for people to help them. Okay, and mm -hmm. uh, there was an older lady that had a drugstore, Rose Grinnell. So we could hear her when we dug her out, put her on a door and carried her and put her in the back of that truck. We'd take her up to the clinic where the triage was and come back. While Mrs. Grinnell had somehow survived the carnage, Others weren't so fortunate. There was a family of the uh, Columbus Gilman. He and his his wife and daughter lived together and they worked at, I mean, they were really, really great people. They couldn't find them. So Harry Jones was a friend of mine. Harry's passed now, but I said, let's go looking for him. So we came up here where the courthouse is, my old home place. It was fields and honeysuckles and thatches and all. We looked and we found them. And they, you know, that's 500 yards from where their house was. And that's, they dropped them one, two, and three, you know, and wow. that's, uh, that'll always be there. And I'd seen Tony, he had come down to check on me. So I left him there and then I went to check on the boys and they were okay. Fantastic. So that was, and then I didn't realize how blessed we were till then I heard, then we saw and realized the extent of everybody else loss. My great-grandmother was killed in the storm. Um, she was with my uncle at the time, my great-uncle at the time. And um, their house was on Green Street, which most people refer to as the hardest hit area. I think it was definitely the largest loss of life. I've heard people say a third of the lives lost or a half, but there were, there were several right there on that small street and she was one of them. Um, my great uncle, Let Craycroft, survived. Um, he, was, he was injured, um, probably a lot more severely <laughs> than what we accounted for, than anybody accounted for. Uh, he was treated that night, but he wasn't taken to a hospital. He and my great grandmother had gotten to their house a few minutes before it hit but he had been able to get her inside the house and had gone back out to get groceries to bring them in and realized that something was going on. So he dropped those and went to get her and um, they had a house probably built in the 1920s, craftsman type house. It had a basement and um, he was below her on the steps, two or three steps below her helping her down the steps. Um, and he said when the tornado hit, he the last thing he saw of her was something separated the steps between them. From that point on, he remembered very briefly being in the air. When he came to, he was about four or five houses down wow. from where his house was. He had a really bad hit to the back of his head. Um, Later on, years later, they said it probably did a lot of damage to his optic nerve. He ended up being blind for probably the last 20 years of his life. And we've realized that as the years go on, how, how fast something can happen to you. But to think that they were safe and they were okay. And then, then when you see or hear how many people lost their lives and there was little ones that lost their lives, families that were wiped out, it's just heart-wrenching. 
The Brandenburg Storm, which remains as the only EF-5 to ever strike the state of Kentucky, was on the ground for 32 miles and grew to over 500 yards wide as it struck the tiny river town, tragically taking the lives of 31 people and injuring more than 300. The memorial service, um, quite frankly, the news media um, was somewhat of a problem. They were in there with their cameras and their lights and here were, here were all these caskets and families grieving and they would go up and put their cameras right in a mother's face while she's looking over the casket. And uh, it, it was not the best of circumstance. Uh, yeah. And it was very distasteful. Uh, I honestly thought some of the families became so agitated and so angry that I honestly thought there was gonna be a riot. The Catholic priest, and I don't recall his name, got up and he started reading from John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. The lights go off. The cameras, the lights had all overloaded the circuit and the lights went off. That man repeated from memory the rest of that chapter out of John 14 until the lights came back on. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face but that had such a calming effect on the whole situation. It's as if it, some, as if the Lord was saying, enough, let's focus on what we need to focus on. It shaped this community. It probably, I mean, 50 years from now, there will probably still be some things around here after we're all gone that will be here or, or not be here because of what happened that day. Um, I think in a lot of ways, we're a closer community because of it, um, because there's there's still a lot of families here in the community that, that did lose someone or lost a house or had their life changed. While Brandenburg received no warning that day, they may have inadvertently helped to save the lives of many others who did. It came on one of them that a state policeman could not get into Brandenburg because of all the debris. And we had been tracking this spot on the radar and it had just passed Brandenburg. And so I went in and picked up the phone, told them to sound the sirens. We put out a warning. I think that was about 18 minutes before it hit the fairground, something like that. Usually you don't have anything close to that lead time to put out a tornado warning, but it was because of the what happened in Brandenburg. When the storm reformed over Louisville as a half mile wide EF4, a warning had already been issued and the word was out that these storms were producing bad tornadoes, helping to get people to safety in time. Despite the fact that the Louisville storm went through a heavily populated area of eastern Jefferson County, thanks in part to the events in Brandenburg, there were only three fatalities. Back in Indiana, the Armstrongs and our friends at Morgan Elementary had dodged the proverbial bullet with no casualties. However, others weren't so fortunate. It's been fascinating to hear over the years the other stories, you know, that, that I didn't know um, and just how close we were to it being a really bad event for us, you know. so just feel very fortunate. I oftentimes think about what would have happened if I hadn't have looked out the door, if we hadn't had a drill and got them in the hallway. If we hadn't have made it to the highway and out, I I'm sure some of my family would have been gone, that would have been dead. We wouldn't have made it on that hill. It was the right move and um, it was the only move we had, but it was the right move. We were very fortunate, and all we lost was a, was material things. The horses, they, they ended up coming back. They were, they'd ran off somewhere. The only thing we lost was material objects that could be replaced. What we didn't lose was any family member, and we feel very fortunate. Meanwhile, Jackie left the property to check on the fate of her neighbors. I went down the lane to check on the, um, an older couple that lived uh, farther down the lane, and um, it had 
thrown them out. They were in their trailer, but it had picked up that trailer and thrown them out of the trailer. The tornado actually picked them up and dumped them. Uh, one of them had a broken arm, and the other one was, uh, I don't remember if they had a broken arm, but they both survived. It was very strange. And then there was a grandmother that lived across the highway from me. She had been babysitting her five-year-old granddaughter, and uh, she died in the storm, unfortunately. And that tornado had picked up that two-story house, ripped off the wallpaper, and threw a cow underneath the foundation and set that house back down. And I took a picture of that house sitting on top of half of a cow. But then it dawned on me at that point that we had no home. Had nowhere to sleep at night. You know, not just us, you know, lots of people. I'm just grateful we all are alive and made it through it. The Indiana EF-5 stayed on the ground through rural parts of the state for 62 miles, killing six and injuring 90 others. This storm would go on to spawn three more EF-4s, including the one that devastated parts of Hanover and Madison. It also went on to produce a second F-5 that struck Sailor Park in Cincinnati as well. Like the Brandenburg storm, the southern Indiana F-5 was largely unwarned, no doubt leading to some of the casualties. However, because of the reports of destruction from DePaul, Palmyra, and Daisy Hill, many others were no notified of the imminent tornado risk in the hours that followed. In total, this tornado family would cross hundreds of miles across southern Indiana, far northern Kentucky, and southwest Ohio, killing two dozen people while injuring close to 700. The April 3, 1974 super outbreak would go on to produce a staggering 148 twisters across 13 states plus one in Canada in only 18 hours. At one point, there were 16 of them on the ground at the same time. The onslaught of tornado producing storms was enough for the National Weather Service at one point to issue a tornado warning for the entire state of Indiana. This was the first and the only time that a tornado warning has ever been issued for an entire state. However, it wasn't just the sheer number of twisters or the amount of real estate that they covered that set this outbreak apart. It was their intensity. Dr. Greg Forbes, who studied and worked under the great Theodore Fujita at the University of Chicago, the inventor of the original F scale, also helped him conduct damage surveys from many of the outbreak's 148 tornadoes. That's kind of the, the one thing I remember about the storm, just the sheer magnitude of the damage uh, that and the, the length of the paths that, that we saw doing some of those damage surveys. And then on subsequently, I went out on the ground with Dr. Vegeta to, to Louisville, to, to Brandenburg, uh, down to Goulin, Alabama, and uh, seeing you know, some of the total destruction in those places that had been hit by, well, in the Goulin and Brandenburg cases, F5 tornadoes. Uh, that was that was that was pretty scary, and there was just nothing left. Everything had been destroyed. The super outbreak produced an unfathomable number of violent tornadoes, including ones that struck Monticello in Madison, Indiana, Xenia in Cincinnati, Ohio, Brandenburg, Louisville, and Frankfort, Kentucky, as well as Gwynn in Huntsville, Alabama, just to name a few. In total, a jaw-dropping 23 EF-4s and 7 F-5s developed between 2 and 10 p.m. on April 3, 1974. The combined total of 30 violent tornadoes remains not just as a record for the most in a single outbreak, but it's the most violent tornadoes recorded in a calendar year. Only this all happened during an eight-hour period. Tragically, 320 people would lose their lives that day and 6,000 more would be hurt. The Twisters produced a staggering $840 million in damages, equating to approximately $5.2 billion in damages today. When it came to how people were killed, the injuries that caused the deaths, and what we found out from, particularly from Brandenburg, but other places as well, was that most of the deaths were from head injuries. And so that began the sequence of events where anytime Dr. Fujita would talk on television or go out to talk to the public somewhere, he would say one of the safety rules for tornadoes would be you should put on a helmet if you had one because the fatal injuries are head, in head injuries. We've obviously learned a lot since 1974. We have all kinds of things now we didn't have then. But what started the modernization of the Weather Service was the 1974 outbreak. 
that report that you referenced about the event done by by NOAA and Department of Commerce, the Weather Service NOAA Department of Commerce, it said, we're not prepared. We need better radar. We need teletype machines that are faster. We have the weather radio program that came out of 74. We have the way to get communities more weather resilient, the weather ready nation concept. All these things happen so for the model, general, the Doppler weather radars came out of 74 and they realized this, we need to be able to look at storms so they can now have, now we can see storms horizontally, vertically in motion to and from the radar and all these things. They didn't have that in 74, they had nothing. Yet despite all the technology that has been developed since 74, the upgrades to our radars, our advanced weather models, and our modern warning system, you still have what happened in 2011. While I'm talking about the April 27th super outbreak that killed over 300 people, but I'm also talking about what happened a month later when on May 22nd, 2011, Joplin, Missouri took a direct hit by a mile wide EF5 tornado that unimaginably took 158 lives. This is something the weather community thought would never happen again in the modern age. I was like you and like many of my colleagues. We didn't think we would ever see another single storm produce 100 fatalities, much, much less have it occur in one city. So that was, that was quite a, a revelation to all of us when that occurred. So what happened? How was it possible that so many people were killed by a single tornado that occurred during the middle of the day? I think the people of Joplin were uh, a little uh, caught off guard because they, they had seen the other storms and they hadn't done anything. And, and they'd had a lot of tornado warnings in Joplin and they'd even blown sirens for some severe thunderstorm warnings in Joplin. So, so they'd have a, had a lot of times when the sirens went off, they'd had a lot of warnings. And I don't think that they were anticipating, prepared, ready to take shelter. Joplin, for example, and uh, El Reno tornado a couple years after that were situations where the whole radar pattern evolved so rapidly that you, you went from what, what you weren't even sure was a tornadic storm to one that all of a sudden is, is EF, potentially EF5. In retrospect, it seems it was a combination of factors that led to so many fatalities in Joplin, including the fact that the storm intensified so rapidly as it had approached the city. In addition, many did not have adequate shelter or did not heed warnings with enough time to get to a proper shelter safe from the ravages of an EF5. With that being said, the 2011 storm season served as a stark reminder to everyone that despite all of our modern weather advances, we are still vulnerable. We are way overdue in this nation for a large violent tornado. So if it happened then, it can happen again. Any of these spring days or, or other seasons, uh, summer and fall as well, we can get all those ingredients together at some place. And even with good warnings, even with Doppler radar, even with the worn on forecast things that we're doing now, getting our numerical models down to where they can predict individual thunderstorms and their intensity. Even with all of that, a, a storm can produce a tornado that hits a city very quickly, and then there may be significant loss of life associated with it. The other thing that's happened in the last 50 years also is that we've gotten more and more urban sprawl. So what used to be sort of the little needles and haystacks in terms of tornado hitting or missing a city, now the city's much bigger, make much bigger targets. And so uh, while we have better, better technology to predict and warn of the upcoming tornadoes, the urban sprawl and the traffic jams and the higher populations and concentrations make it a little bit harder perhaps to avoid the tornado. And But the rareness of a five, uh, we keep expanding beyond the cities, right? Louisville has gone way out, right? Way out, Xenia, Dayton, way out. It's going to hit more than it's ever hit before because we just keep going out and out and out in the rural areas. So more people are gonna get hit, not less, more. But, w but we can be prepared. We have much better preparedness activities. Uh, people know what to do. We're now building our structures more strongly, particularly houses. Uh, people who live in, in uh, manufactured homes now know, now know that they probably need to evacuate and hopefully they have a plan and a place to go. 
And so there are a lot of positive things that will help. But just like Joplin showed us, it's not going to obfuscate the whole problem. We will still, unfortunately, have a lot of casualties and fatalities and still tremendous damage because we do not build. It's just not cost effective to build against the most violent tornado. We don't have uh, structures that in most cases are capable of protecting us from the, the most violent of tornadoes if, if it's bad luck that you're hit by one of those. Reporting on the 50th anniversary of the April 3rd, 1974 super outbreak, I'm meteorologist Jeremy Kappel. So when I tell my story, I tell it to honor the memory of those lives that were lost. I tell it to support those survivors that were left behind and struggled for years and years with those losses. Uh, so it's in their memory and their honor. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure there's a lot of kids, of course, we're all in our 50s now, mm -hmm. um, from that time period that, like myself, we probably have some PTSD of, you know, what we went through. It's just the scared feeling of not, if thinking a tornado's gonna come again. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's still vivid and, Uh, I just never want to go through another one. There's a lot of memories and we don't ever forget this and we appreciate you doing this because mm -hmm. it's, there's so many families that were affected by it. Yeah. And so many memories of, of heroic things that people did to save other people. We're survivors. I speak for a lot of people who don't feel comfortable speaking because of, of what they still carry, the pain they still carry in their hearts because of that day. But we are survivors. We are people who will work together and we will support each other and love each other. We were, by the grace of God, we, were, we made it. <laughs>